Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right, this morning, you you can scan right there in the back of your um, chairs. The notes are going to be there. This morning, I want to begin with a, a quote that provoked me and uh, provoked this message this morning. But it goes something like this. He goes, most believers are not in danger of ruining their lives. Most of them are facing a greater danger, and that's wasting it. It's wasting it. How many guys don't want to waste your life? None of us want to waste our lives, right? How do people waste their life? No vision. We talked about vision last week. Disappointments, setbacks, the things that the unexpected takes place, the next thing you know, it just kind of throws you off your equilibrium, and then a lot of people don't recover from that. But we need to have a vision, uh, you know, to, to carry us, to, to, to make us run the race that God has before us. Um, God has better for every single one of us. He wants to do amazing things in 2024 in and through our lives because that's just what God wants to do. He wants to use you in great and mighty ways. So let's not waste it. We have to be willing, though, to go all in. Not partially, all in. Notice what it says right here in Joshua, the third chapter. It says that consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. God wants to do amazing things among us. At that time right there, um, the, the, the next thing that took place, they had to sell out. They had to consecrate themselves. They were taking the Ark of the Covenant. And right before the promised land, they had to go through the Jordan. And the, 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 the instructions were when you get to the edge of the river of, of, of the Jordan, you got to put your feet in. Yep. And whenever you put your feet in, everything will split. Everything will part. Read the story. And so, so, but they had to separate themselves, and God did amazing things, and they entered into the promised land. And so I, I want to encourage you this morning that there's some things that we just have to, to, to burn in our lives. There's some things that we have to consecrate. There's, there's our lives that we have to consecrate in order to see God's best in our marriage, in our business, in our personal lives. Amen? we got to set ourselves apart and go all in. We don't have time to play games or play patty cake with Jesus. Amen? I mean, he just wants to, he just, he's, he's looking for people to go all in. There's a guy by the name of uh, Spanish explorer Herman uh, Cortes. February 19th, 1519, he set sail to go conquer the Aztec nation there in Mexico. And when he left, he had 11 ships, 13 horses, 110 sailors, and 553 soldiers. The population of the Aztec empire at that time was approximately 5 million people when he goes to the shore there. The odds against him were 7,541 to 1. That was kind of not good odds, right? His soldiers were tired of the voyage. They were in a different land. The natives were unfriendly. But Cortez did something that the cowboys didn't do last week. Fight. He got up and fight. What Cortez did to motivate them, he says, hey, listen, I'm going to get rid of your plan B. Your plan B is the ships that you want to go back to so that you can go back because the odds are against us. So he goes and he burns the ships. And he was basically burning plan B. I don't know about you, but most people are living plan B right now. <clears throat> and we got to just get destroy plan B. We got to burn those things. They always have a plan B in the pocket. And so today, the opportunity that we're going to have this morning is to burn the ships of our past and to embrace the path into our future. I don't know about you, but uh, you're a lot like me. I had to burn some ships in the past, the ships named past failure, the ships named my old way of life. My, uh, my ship was named Missed Opportunities. There's all kinds of things that I could name on there, but I had to burn those things in order for me to move forward and keep moving forward in the things and the plans. Little did I know that I'd be doing this. But all I know is that whatever was before me, I had to separate myself and consecrate myself in order to move forward. And that's precisely what we see this morning in the book of 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, with the, with the character by the name of Elisha. We're going to take a look at Elisha's life today. And there was a time when he faced an opportunity to go all in and to fulfill the call of God that he had upon his life. He was going from a farmer to a prophet. It's a big step. That's like a, a drug addict to a pastor, okay? We know, we know one, yeah. He's God's favorite Mexican pastor. He's amazing. 
So he turns, so in this situation, he turns his, his farming equipment, his plowing equipment into a barbecue place so that he can uh, 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 barbecue all of his oxen that he was, he was using. Well, take a look at that. He burns all that kind of stuff. Basically, his identity was as a farmer at that time, but he says, no longer will I be a farmer. I'm going to be a prophet now. So we're going to take a look at that text this morning. We'll find ourselves in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, and we'll take a look at some of those passages this morning. He was an ordinary kid. Growing up, Elijah was. He's just growing up on a farm. Got some overalls. overalls. I should have worn those things. They're in the middle of a three-year drought because Elijah, the current prophet, had just detect, you know, had just determined that there was going to be a three-year drought. So they're in the middle of a three-year drought, and he's working the farm, plowing those dry, cracked, parched fields. And while Elijah, here's a beautiful thing, while Elijah was fulfilling the duties of a father, God was planning his future as a prophet. Right now, God is strategically doing things in our lives to get us to the next place. Could be a calling, could be a relationship, it could be whatever that is, he's strategically always uh, on behind the scenes. But we have to, Elisha found himself in a place where that was uh, right before him and he had to get rid of his past He had to say bye to his past, bye to his plow, bye to his parents in order to pursue what God had. Now, side note, the only way God would use Elisha in this manner is that he had to have a predecessor by the name of Elijah, who was the current prophet. And so I just need to just share a couple things right there before uh, this leads into what happened when Elisha was called. So Elijah, many of us know Elijah, a story about Elijah. I don't know if you see that. Can you put that next slide on there? Elijah was, had just, you know, he was a, a major prophet. If you read, just encourage you to read 1 Kings 18 and 19. He was on Mount Carmel. They're dealing with all these prophets of Baal, you know, and then he overcame. He had a great, great victory uh, there in Mount Carmel. And afterwards, Jezebel, who was a crazy lady there, said, man, what, because he killed like all the prophets. Elijah was like, he was a beast. He was amazing. <clears throat> he was Parsons on steroids. <laughs> and so, so all of a sudden, he said, hey, listen, <clears throat> I'm going to have to do something here. Jezebel threatens his life because he, she says, hey, what you did to my prophets, I'm going to do to you by tomorrow. So he got scared. I mean, this guy just over, overcame a big obstacle. And now this gal speaks, and he gets timid and afraid. And actually, he's tired. He's burned out. He's tired. And so all of a sudden, the simple suggestions or simple threats all of a sudden turn insurmountable. And he takes off and he goes, hides under a juniper tree. He runs into the wilderness. He wants to die. He wants to like, I'm the only one left. He's feeling sorry for himself. And then all of a sudden, while he's there, you know, just frustrated and, 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 and uh, feeling sorry for himself, an angel comes and begins to feed him so he can get strength back in. Give him some water. He comes back. He does it again. Feeds him again. And finally, when he gets all refreshed and stuff, he, he goes to Mount Horeb, and he's there hiding in the cave. And God speaks to him in that place, and he says, Elijah, what are you doing there? That's where we pick up this story right quick. And in verse uh, 11 of 1 Kings 19, it says, then he says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. I'm going to come and speak to you. And so what happens? The Lord passes by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountain, and it broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. You know, in heaven right now, it'd be like, Peter would be like, wait a minute, what do you mean he's not in the wind? He came as a rushing mighty wind. He's in the wind. He wasn't that time. So he comes again. And this time, and again, after the wind, he comes in an earthquake. But the Lord was not the Lord. The Lord was not in an earthquake. But Peter could have easily said, or Paul and Silas like, yes, he is in an earthquake at midnight. I was in prison. All of a sudden, God spoke, and, you know, everything just shattered. Well, he wasn't in that earthquake, though. And then again, after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And Moses would have been like, yeah, he's in the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have said, yeah, he's in the fire, man. He got me out of the fire. But this time, he wasn't in the fire. And then after that, again, he comes in a still, small voice. Isn't that beautiful? And then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, 
of Abel Mehola. It's, it's a very, it's called the Dancing of Metals, where he was located. It's a very rich, luxurious place. And he shall be anointed as prophet in your place. I wanted to put that, preface that before this morning, because I had to ask you a question. Can you discern his voice today? Or are we relying upon how he spoke to you in times past? He might have spoken to you in the fire, but that's when he's going to speak to you in the fire this time. That's right. So we have to consistently, over and over again, right. stay connected to the master right. because we need to respond to whichever voice we hear him speaking. Sometimes those are just false voices. Yeah. Yeah. The scripture says that there's many voices and there's none without significance. <clears throat> a lot of times people are like, man, I feel like the Lord is like, he has nothing to do with feelings. Mm. He speaks to your spirit. Yeah. You go from feeling to knowing. Right. When you hear the voice of God, you'll know the voice of God yeah. because your feelings are not in there. Right. And your mind is like, that's crazy. Right. But that just might be the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Go start this church. Like, oh, what, what, what? So, can you he discern his voice today? So, now here we are in verse 19. This is when the two meet. Verse 19, it says, So, he departs from there. He finds Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing the 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12. So, imagine this. I don't know if you have a picture of those ox, but, you know, there's, there's 12 pairs of oxen. That's a lot of meat. That's a lot of barbecue, man. I'm telling you. And he's behind the 12th one. Okay, and so so there he is right there. And I just thought about this idea. Number one, you know, God uses ordinary people to do the greater work. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? He turns shepherds into kings. Yeah. He turns murderers into leaders. God's chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. The wise. Yes, he but he just does these incredible, amazing things. But he's plowing. He's the 12th one. You know, God's looking for a guy who's a little bit radical, a little bit. Other people might think, like, I don't know if he's all there or not. I mean, a guy who's willing to just be obedient to the extreme, to sell out and love him and honor him and lead and, 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 and follow him. Amen? So on the 12th one, so it's like, if you think about it, the first one goes because it's, been a, dry, it's a dry parched land. Okay, go, do that. Make the row. So they're making the row, and he's just barely hitting the surface of the, of the dirt. And then he turns around and is like, hey, go again. The second one goes. Goes a little bit deeper. Do it again. The third one goes a little bit deeper. The fourth one, hey, do it again. It's getting a little bit deeper. It's getting cut now. And Elisha is the 12th one. By the time the 12th one comes in, it's a little bit softy and mushier. It's a little bit deeper. And it takes a little bit more strength to push. But he was willing to do that. So there he finds him in that place right there, plowing the 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th one. And it goes on to say, then Elijah passes by him and he throws the mantle on him. In other words, that's a commissioning that you're, you're now going to be a prophet. Take on this calling. You're going from farmer to prophet now. And Elijah, look what he says right here. It says, um, Elijah goes straight after him. He leaves the oxen. Runs after Elijah, and he says, please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I'll follow you. Immediately, he leaves his oxen. He goes, he goes, hey, you know, in the New Testament, remember somebody said, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you, but let me just go back. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus said, man, no man, you know, having his hand put to the plow and turning back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you want to be my disciple, you know, leave everything, deny yourself. But in this case, he's allowed, so he goes back and does that. And immediately he says, don't you forget what I told you, and he's going to follow him. The second idea I got is this. Number two, you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. Come on. Come on. You don't have to understand the whole plan. All he wants is an immediate response right. to what he's asking you to do. Amen. I coach young men as disciples of Christ, and one of the first things I ask them is I just say, hey, look, just say yes, Lord. I don't, whatever it is, just say yes. It might seem like it's crazy, but just say yes. I remember sitting there in my living room on a couch, and I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, go down to pick and pack. I'm going to show you a man I want you to talk to. I was like, what in the world? So I told Natalie, he goes, Marcus, you're crazy. I was like, I didn't think of that thing, so I just take off. And sure enough, as soon as I got to the pick and pack, there was a guy sitting there uh, arriving in his truck, 
uh, about to grab the phone that old phones they used to put dimes in. <laughs> Pay phone, yeah, there you go. And he says, that's him right there. Got to meet him. But it's the crazy, I mean, so many stories of just immediate obedience. You don't have to understand fully to obey immediately, right? Isaiah says, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. We all want God to respond immediately to our request, don't we? Isn't that true? We do. We do. It's yeah. like, come on, God, let's do it. I mean, I, I got to get this. Rent is due now. Mm. What if God chose to answer your request at the speed of how you respond to his? Oh. <laughs> I think I got my point across. <laughs> he goes on to say, and he says to him, go back again. For what I have done to you. So Elisha turns back from him, takes the yoke of oxen and slaughters them, boiled their flesh using the oxen equipment, and he gave it to the people and they ate. Yep. Another idea, another point is that you can never enter into a new life until you're willing to set fire to the old one. And that's exactly what takes place right here. A radical, fanatical, climatical sacrifice that he takes place, that takes place right here. He sacrifices the animals to sustain him, and he burns the equipment that he was identified with. He's identified as a farmer. Plows belong to farmers. Are you, are you listening to me? Not prophets. And he was willing to burn that up. His overalls came off. And he puts on the mantle and the cloak of a prophet. And he walks in that place. Elijah isn't just selling out. Man, he's buying in. He's buying into all that God has for his life. Now, this is the very thing, the oxen that actually, you know, sustained his life, sustained those in his family, sustained everyone else. And he, what does he do with them? He makes barbecue out of them. <laughs> 24 or at least two oxen are slaughtered there, and he goes back, and he feeds. You know, there's always something that we have to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If there's something that you and I are going to do again and again and again in our walk with Christ, it's going to be two things. One, sacrifice, and two, surrender. surrender. Yeah. In this case, he sacrifices something that was probably precious to him, or maybe he was mad at him. He's like, man, I'm going to burn you. I don't know what it, what it was, but he, he, he sacrificed it, and he used the sacrifice to serve others. <laughs> that will preach by itself. <laughs> you are in a place where he's asking you, I need you to sacrifice that. Mm. Mm. And the sacrifice that you make is for the purpose of serving that individual. You know, right now, we are... Um, I'm sacrificing a portion of my morning because I get up early and I go. And I realize if I want a stronger marriage, I need to take some time and do a devotion and do something with my spouse. So I'm willing to sacrifice, uh, you know, a certain amount of time, 30 minutes or so. And I'll leave early, but I'll come back at 7 or 730 because Natalie and I do our devotion. And we serve each other by doing this and we receive communion together. He's, so we can get stronger in our marriage. Our marriage is in trouble, guys. No, I'm just kidding. But I choose because how many of you guys know that if you want a long, sustaining, healthy, strong marriage, it takes work. It does. It takes effort. Now, come on. It just doesn't happen no, all does. of a sudden. Nope. You can't treat them like an ox. Right. <laughs> you got to do something with it, right? You got to, yeah, you got to burn your old ways. And so, so he's asking us to sacrifice some things. Notice right here at the very end, uh, Elijah, after he did that, he sold out. He bought into the plan that God had for his life. And it says, now he arose and followed Elisha, Elijah, and he became his what? His servant. He became his servant. The path to a greater life revolves around doing these two things over and over again that I just mentioned. Surrender and sacrifice. And God is more interested in your full obedience rather than your full understanding of what he's wanting you to do. He just wants you and I to obey. But we have to make a statement. If we're serious about what God's wanting to do in our, in our, in our year 2024, we got to make a statement, a bold statement. And I don't know what he's doing to you. I know what he's doing to me. But Elijah had to burn his plow. Mm. Uh, um, Peter had to leave his boat. Yeah. The tax collector had to take all the possessions that he owned and give half of it to the poor. Mm. 
There's always a sacrifice involved, right? The prostitute that came to Christ, she surrendered the alabaster uh, uh, perfume and gave that up to serve and follow him. The spiritual turning point in our lives is when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change. Isn't that the truth? I hear Joel say this all the time. He goes, but when the, if you, whenever, whenever you want to just tip on over and you get over into the God side of things in your walk with Christ, this is when it takes place, is when the pain of staying the same is like, man, I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of dealing with this over and over and over again. When that becomes so strong, the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change. That's usually when people begin to do something radical, right? That's true. So what am I supposed to do with all this information, Pastor? Thank you for asking. <laughs> One question. What do you need to sacrifice in your life? You came here this morning for I'm not sure what, hopefully not entertainment, but I'm here to speak to you this morning and say there's something that we need to sacrifice this year. If we want to fulfill the dream and the thing that God put in our heart, the desires in our heart, there's something that has to be sacrificed. What is that? Maybe it's an old friend. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a hurt. Maybe it's a hang up. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's dealing with this individual. I'm not sure what that is in your life, but there's going to be a sacrifice. And this will be something that you constantly do over and over again and again in your walk. Number two, what do you need to surrender? And I want to encourage you, if you're living your life with plan B already in place, surrender your plan B. Surrender your plan B for plan A. He had to surrender dad's vision. Hey, son, you're a farmer for divine vision. No, you're called a prophet. He was faithful as a farmer. He was faithful as a son. God honored him and promoted him to something, to do something, you know, tremendously amazing. As a matter of fact, uh, he got a double portion of the anointing that Elijah had. He did, Elijah did eight miracles. Elisha did 16 miracles. It's an amazing story. You've got to read it. But what do you need to burn? What do you need to sacrifice? And what do you need to surrender? His old identity, your old identity. Man, this is, this is what people know me for. No longer am I that person. I'm now this person. I'm, my identity now is in Christ. And you watch. You watch the outside begin to match the faith that you have on the inside. Little by little, all year long. There's a group of missionaries a century ago that were, became known as the one-way missionaries. I, I think I've shared this story with you before. There's a bunch of dra- brave souls who wanted to go out there and preach the gospel to a, a tribe. They were known as headhunters. Uh, every single missionary that ever went into that field... Uh, came back, didn't never came back. They were, all, they were all dead. And this group of missionaries packed up all their gear. They didn't get a suitcase, but they packed it in a coffin. And they, because they knew that it was a one-way trip, that none of them would ever see the light of the game. A.W. Milne was one of those missionaries, and he set sail for the Hebrides uh, in the South Pacific. And when he lands there, he stays there for 30-something years. And Milne, even though he knew those headhunters were there, he never feared for his life because he already died to himself. And in that place, he loved on them for 35 years among the tribe. Then he dies. And the people of that uh, tribe, they they bury him right in the middle of of that village. And they put this on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. But when he left, there was no darkness. Complete darkness. Surrender to the call and the mission that God has for his life. Complete surrender isn't radical. It's normal. Yeah. I love Mark Batterson's quote when he says, you know what? God, God didn't call you. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that you and I can play it safe. He died to make us dangerous. God's plan for our life is not an insurance plan. It's a dangerous plan. It's a radical plan. It's a daring plan plan. And so I dare you. <laughs> I double dare you. I double dog dare you in a Mexican way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> to sell out to him in 2024. But you're going to do this again and again and again 
and again, what? Sacrifice something and surrender something. It has never stopped. In the near 40 years that I've been serving him, there's always something more to sacrifice. Oh, let that go. And some of the stuff he's asking us to do is not anything wrong or bad, right? It's 948. Father, we love you. You're so good to us. Thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. And I don't know how this lands, but Father, I just pray that you speak so clearly and that you embolden people's faith to surrender and to just cut it off and to embrace the new into the future. We trust you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said amen. 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 Hey, guys, we love you so very much. Uh, next Wednesday is going to be night of worship. So I think it is, isn't it? No, two weeks. Sorry. I don't know what I'm saying. You guys have a great week. We will see you this next Sunday. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.